vamos con la última presentación. La verdad que no podíamos abordar y no podíamos entrar en el mundo de, de, de las tendencias, de, de la eficacia, sin hablar de, de la programática, que hoy en día es una realidad. Va a terminar hablando Duncan Tree, que es vicepresidente de publicidad y efectividad de Comscore. En particular nos va a hablar cómo identificar el inventario que realmente es el que está impulsando la, la comunicación efectiva dentro del entorno programático. Good afternoon, everybody, and well done for making it through to the last presentation. Hopefully, this will be of interest, even if you're not involved directly in the digital media world. This this subject of uh, verification of what is actually delivered versus what is planned has probably been the hottest topic in digital media for the last three or four years. And it's been evolving and it's shaping and it's highly disruptive. And the reason it's controversial is that in reality it affects pretty much every business model in the digital ecosystem. And it's been a bit of a rude awakening for a large number of people involved in digital. Just as a brief way of background, I've come from the trading environment within digital. I've built and uh, sold on large sales networks, etc, etc. So when I first got involved in this, I naively thought it was going to be adopted pretty well straight away by the whole industry. Um, but the fact that it is affecting so many business models um, has mean that it has, has gone through a, a big journey. So what I want to talk about today is what is verification? How does it work? What does it expose? And to look at its evolution and actually now its usage in finding the inventory with any given campaign that is actually doing the work. So I wanted to start off by talking about why there is a lack of trust in digital. Okay? If you go back, and in some cases it's still happening, and you look at planning and buying on individual sites, it's highly efficient in terms of understanding where your delivery is. When I first set up my sales network and worked in the portals, and it was very easy to see your advertising. Now you can spend millions of pounds and have no idea where it's running. But there's indicative amount of wastage in that model, not just in terms of hitting the right target audience, but also crucially in terms of workflow, in terms of the efficiencies of scalability. Digital is almost infinite. There are so many different places that you can buy media from. If you fast forward now into both the pro programmatic world, but also into the evolution of a lot of the technologies, and certainly the second generation of digital networks that are targeting users based on behaviour and what they've actually been up to, that wastage is largely gone. Both in terms of workflow, you don't have to do a huge media schedule if someone can reach the right target audience, but mostly in terms of actually hitting the right people. But the downside of this, and I think this underpins trust in digital as a whole, is that now you can have no idea where you, you can spend, as I said, you can spend millions of pounds and never actually see your ad running, so you have to trust the numbers. So verification is a way of actually, in its simple terms, looking at exactly what was actually delivered. So what is it? It's got four key pillars. Okay? What percentage of the campaign hit your right target audience? Did it appear in an environment that was harmful to your brand? Viewability, which is um, probably the largest area of the conversation, probably the most complex, but certainly for the last couple of years, fraud and the scale of fraud and all its types, which I'll talk about in a bit, has proliferated across all of these. So we've seen an evolution of point vendors for each of these various areas over the last few years. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why we're now seeing that they're useful in isolation, but actually they're only really a solution when they're and that's down to the way that fraud is affecting viewability rates, brand safety capabilities, and crucially, the actual attribution or the campaign effectiveness that the campaign achieves. It can be very misleading if fraud is not taken out. So validated inventory has got to be the goal for everyone in the market. Is, is it viewable? Could it have been seen, crucially, in the geography that I actually wanted it to run, in an environment that's non-harmful to my brand, Crucially, as I say, and I'll say again and again through the presentation, by human beings, and was it hit, did it hit the right target audience? That's the stuff that's doing the work in any given campaign. And that actually can be summarised into a very simple sentence. Could the ad have been seen by human eyes in a brand safe environment? You have to be able to say with confidence as a marketer in a modern digital age, 
yes to that question, otherwise you're at great risk. So, detecting invalid traffic. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to do because it's very fluid in its nature. On some days we see low single figures in terms of percentages of the inventory that we're monitoring. Other days we see huge spikes. But it's estimated by most of the industry bodies and most of the people that have done research that up to 36% on average in digital media is fraudulent. That means it can't be seen by human eyes. Okay? And I'm going to explain a little bit more about that, what that is. So, fraud is difficult to explain because it's so multifaceted. Okay? <coughs> We've all heard of bots, and I'm going to explain briefly how they actually work, because I think that puts a lot of this into context. But fraud is also things like masking URLs or domain hijacking, which is where sites are claiming to be something they are, being bought in good faith and landing us elsewhere. It could be impression stacking, so lots of ads are served on top of each other. Uh, click farms, content scrapers. The point of this slide is A, to show the variety of fraud that's out there, but also with regards to verification tools that have sophisticated non-human traffic like Comscore's VCE, we have to be able to keep on top of every single type of fraud there is and to monitor it and eliminate it and extrapolate it out from results that we show our clients. So I want to just um, explain briefly, and I could talk for an hour about this slide alone, about how bots actually work. <laughs> bots are when devices are hijacked by, let's call them the central bot master. And this is actually very, very prolific. <coughs> I'm sure most of the people in this room have done it on sites that are distributing content free of charge that's not theirs. So it's file sharing sites, downloading movies, music, etc. etc. <coughs> Malware is highly prolific in these environments. But what basically happens is by downloading something, you're inadvertently infecting your computer with the virus. Okay? You've got no idea that this is happening. The dotted line, everything that's happening on the right, the user has no idea. You do not see this. <coughs> you can't emphasize that strongly enough. So the next time that user, after the computer is um, hijacked, and actually there's an article that came out yesterday that says we've actually found, uh, the industry has found a bot that's actually hijacked over 8 million devices. That's a huge amount of devices. Because the first thing that happens when the user opens a window uh, to access the web is behind the scenes, that computer will start to open and close rapidly thousands of emails, that windows in a given period of time, which is creating a profile for that computer that is very attractive for the advertising community. Okay? The second thing it does is it will actually open and close windows and increasingly intelligently serve in advertising into this. And remember, this can't be seen. This is happening behind the scenes. So that's actually starting to serve advertising, which is finding its way into the digital ecosystem. <coughs> so this is a black market economy of highly attractive inventory that looks really attractive for the advertisers themselves and the agencies that is fraudulent. And actually, the next slide I'm going to show you some statistics that I just want to explain before I do. When the, pro when the bot is actually creating a profile, it's opening and closing legitimate sites. So even highly legitimate sites that are selling traffic have a problem with fraud. And you can see here on the right hand side, this is Comscore's uh, global data. But even premium sites, and these are the top 100 sites in our, in our database, have areas of traffic that have up to 25% fraudulent activity. And that's not their fault, and they're doing nothing wrong, it's because their sites are being opened up by these bots behind the scenes. So people have said to me on a regular basis over the last couple of years, I don't need to use fraud protection because I'm just buying the site direct. Couldn't be further from the truth. And when you start to look at non-premium sites, it's the mid and the long tail, the problem is substantially worse. So this is, this is a, a big um, issue within the marketplace. Just briefly, I'm going to talk about, and the whole of the rest of this is not salesy in any way, exactly how at Comscore we track um, fraud. It's based on what's called tag methodology. So we will wrap the creative tag with our code, and then it's trafficked as normal. And then what we're looking for is suspicious fingerprints of activity. So it might be diagonal traffic is too perfect, or too linear in terms of its delivery. It might be old data centers, or data centers that are suddenly seeing a spike, and a whole raft of other things. But that tag-based methodology is only as good as the data that is used to, track, to be monitored. And at Comscore, we combine that with our panelist data, and crucially our census tags, which are published tags that are on about 80% plus of the legitimate web. So we're interacting with nearly two trillion interactions a month in the search for fraud, so we tend to find a lot of it. Um, but that's a, a crucial point to understand as we go through. So 
I just wanted to illustrate this with a specific example of what fraud is, and probably the most prevalent out there at the moment, particularly with regards to bots and indeed intellectual property fraud. And that's what's called domain hijacking. So what is it? The advertiser is placing an ad on a premium site. This is what they think is happening. And of course, their ad then appears on that premium site. What's happening with domain hijacking is not that. They think they're placing an ad on a premium site, but they end up on shadywebsite.com. This is particularly uh, prevalent, as I said, within IP uh, fraud. So sites, big sites like um, Pirate Bay or Demonoid, they will put their inventory into the digital media ecosystem claiming it's something it isn't. And every single impression will have a different masked, dynamic, and ever-changing URL stream. So it's an incredibly difficult thing to track down. The only way you can, and I won't get too technical about this, is to see the difference between the environment that the ad is being called to versus where it finally lands. And you have to be able to see through wireframes and a whole series of other things. So it's a big, big problem. But there are tools, and again, all the way through this presentation, tools do exist to uh, largely cut this out, but it's going to be an arms race over the next few years. So I often ask, well, how prolific is it? And I showed you the IAB statistics that said 36%. We don't benchmark it because it's too fluid, but what we do do is we extrapolate it out before we show the averages by market. We've got all of these, if you're interested, broken down into individual countries, but I thought it'd be useful to show it on a global level. Of what the in-view or the viewability rate, how many of the ads were actually seen are, and what the in-target audience was. And remember, this is on delivery. This is the actuals that actually happened. And you can see pretty much universally that they're, they're, they're similar. You could look at that in one of two ways. You could say, my God, I'm wasting half my traffic. Or actually, more realistically, you could say, I know now what's doing the work, and I can identify and optimize against it and make my campaign work a lot harder, because this is a reality. One of the biggest problems that's faced the uh, evolution of this in the marketplace is that different vendors in this space often show on exactly the same campaign. So if a client is running one or more vent uh, two or more vendors on the same campaign to see which one they want to work with, huge differences in terms of what they will report back. And this is particularly important or relevant within viewability rates. I've seen it as extreme as one vendor is saying the viewability rates on that campaign was 80% and another one saying it's 45. Now that's pretty substantial difference, at which point advertisers throw their hands in the air and say, well, if you can't even get some kind of consistency, how can we possibly trust these numbers? So the MRC, uh, Media Rating Council in America, the ABC and the IOB have done a huge amount of work over the last couple of years to accredit, or effectively uh, test, the vendors themselves to see where this discrepancy is coming from. So that will tell us whether an ad was served above the fold or in the screen whether it was served below the fold, and if, if, it, if the user scrolled down, did it come into view, and if, for how long. When you compare the methodologies that are the same, there's less than 1% discrepancy. So it actually comes down to what the tools are measuring. Okay? I've talked about non-human traffic or fraud. Is that being taken out by the vendor? Do they have the capabilities to detect that before they calculate viewability rates? Absolutely crucial. And the Media Rating Council is now suggesting that for 2016 that has to be a prerequisite to become accredited. But there's also things like, and we all do it, if you've got multiple windows open, are you measuring all of them or just the one that in view at the time? Again, that makes a massive difference. Is it measuring if an ad is served, if that's your screen, way up here or way up there? Clearly, detecting fraud makes a fundamental difference. Let me explain that as I go through. So Measure A has highly sophisticated fraud detection, and it's monitoring a campaign of 15 million impressions, and it finds that 5 million of them, or a third, are fraudulent. So that means there's a universe of 10 million impressions that aren't fraudulent that the viewability rate should be calculated from. If you then apply an 85% viewability rate, 8.5 million of those impressions have been seen, and 1.5 haven't, of the legitimate ones. So that gives you a viewability rate of 57%. 8.5 million divided by the original gross of 15. <coughs> Vendor 2 is doing the same thing, same campaign, but because they're not using highly sophisticated fraud detection software, they're using databases, for example, of known fraud. They're only finding 2 million on the same inventory, which means that the universe is 13 million, of which the same 85% gives you 11 million. But you end up with a viewability rate of 75 percent <coughs> And why am I showing you this? because that's very attractive. That 74% is attractive in market. If you've got an advertiser that's turning to their agency and saying, 
I've seen all this stuff about viewability. I want my viewability rate to be as high as possible. Then they're going to use a tool that shows a higher viewability rate. But they're actually compounding the problem. And future decisions about marketing activity and how successful campaigns work are hugely uh, influenced by this. And I'll just show you this again with um, Illustrative for uh, target audience. So an Illustrative campaign, 20, imp excuse me, 20 impressions. Five reach human females, eight reach non-human females, five reach males, and two reach non-human males. Okay? You look at that, you don't take out fraud, you think you've had a 65% success rate in your target audience. The reality is you've had 25%. And again, if you're making decisions on whether your creative is working well, whether the conversion metrics are working well, everything that influences future decisions in terms of marketing, that's going to be highly misleading at best. And if you're not taking out fraudulent activity, um, it's going to be the same for all aspects of attribution. And lastly, I just wanted to talk about a note on brand safety, harmful to that particular brand. And what's brand safe for one brand might not be for another. The best illustration of that is gambling advertising are actually quite happy to appear on pornography, for example. Um, and actually on the right hand side, you can see within live news feeds, clearly Malaysian Airlines would not want it to have appeared next to any articles about airline crashes. But pretty much every advertiser is fine with that. But what I wanted to concentrate on today is the stuff over here that's shaded pink. This is where the real harm happens in terms of PR and brand safety, and this is where fraud detection is so crucial. Because with bots and with IP fraud or intellectual property fraud, these are the people that are masking their URLs. This is where you need fraudulent detection in order to be able to offer that ability to block the ad happening in the first place. So non-human traffic or fraud affects everything. It affects viewability, it affects attribution, it affects brand safety. It is 